Hello, everybody. Welcome to Why We Podcast. My name is Vikram Rajan. I am your host and the co-founder of Video Socials. We are a community of attorneys and accountants, coaches and consultants who video blog together, fun and done. They also come on to Video Socials, video blogging clubs and record their promo videos for their podcasts, which is a nice segue into uh, this podcast. It's really where those kind of professionals who have a podcast share why and how their show helps in three dimensions. Uh, certainly, they, they're doing their show because it helps them in some way. It markets their practices. And we, we want to learn a little bit more of how and why their podcast fits into their marketing. Uh, but I'm sure, sure that all of their podcasts are very resourceful and educational and helpful for their audience. It could be their potential clients. It could be other type of viewers and listeners to their podcast, to their video show or live stream. And undoubtedly, uh, as a dialogue type podcast, they bring on guests, subject matter experts. And in one way or another, the show also helps their guests. It may help their guests promote their expertise provide them cross-promotional content in a variety of ways uh, helps their guests. And today I'd, I'd love to hear why we podcast with David Barnett. David, can you share a little bit before we even go into your podcast, what do you do professionally? How and who do you work with? Great. Uh, Vic, I'm sort of a mixture between a coach and a consultant. So what I do professionally is I help people buy and sell businesses in right. the main street business space. So most of my clients are working on deals with an under $500,000 EBITDA. That's the level of cash flow that the business sure. would produce. And um, earnings before, before uh, paying interest, taxes. Depreciation yes. and amortization. Okay. So you, so you you add back a few things and you get that EBITDA level. And so we're talking about primarily smaller owner managed, typically businesses. And I work with buyers and sellers. And I, I say that I'm a, a coach and consultant because certain aspects of that transition I do for people as a consultant. So I will work on evaluations, what we call packaging documents that we can put in front of a buyer of a business, for example. Um, but then I also coach people through the process because it's a, a process that very few people have done a lot. And a lot of people will start a business or inherit a business. And then one day they'll want to sell and they've never done that before. Or someone wants to grow a business through acquisition and they've never done that before. Or somebody wants to leave a job they don't enjoy and they want to buy a business to create their own their own path. And they've never done that before. So so the coaching part is sort of guiding, you know, what do we need to do step by step as we go sure. through? So so working with people one on one and I do have one group program as well. Those are the cornerstones of my business. Interesting. So you, you guide people through the process. So stateside, we're saying process for, for uh, our listeners and watchers, process. Uh, and, and that is a telltale sign that you are up in. Well, I, I'm based in Canada, but I work yeah. around the world. Okay, good. So, so really... That'll give you a nice question. Okay. <laughs> good. So work around the world. So in Canada, right? That's the word, that's where, where process comes from. Um, and, but work around the world and Main Street businesses. So can you give me examples? Uh, what do you mean by Main Street businesses? Well, it's, it's typically those smaller businesses that are owner managed. And the reason why I talk about it from the point of view of cash flow it, and rather than sales or the number of employees is that you can have a business with a high revenue, yeah. but it's still functionally a small business. I'll give you an example. Someone who distributes heating oil, right? Um, they may have tens of millions of dollars in sales, but 98% of the money that comes in goes out to purchase the oil. Right. And so it's still a small business with, you know, 14 employees and, and everything. And so um, I use that cash flow measure simply because once we get north of there, we typically get into larger, more professionally managed type of businesses. And it's a different field. It's a different mm -hmm. set of rules. And you have more of the sort of uh, MBA Wall Street-ish type people play in that field. And, and it gets a little bit different from what I do. So Main Street can be like home services, retail. Um, is there something that I'm missing? So it's like the, the it will the it can be construction. It can be distribution. It can really be the whole gamut of businesses, mm -hmm. um, even online businesses and IT businesses. Sure. There's uh, when when people think of of online businesses, they think of the Silicon Valley experience with these big, explosively growing companies. Right. But there's a huge number of what we can term as small Main Street businesses that operate online where one or a few people are working every day and everyone's drawing a wage and everyone's making a living. 
and it still falls within that Main Street space, and uh, even though it's online. So you're in the world of, of being a business broker. Is that another phrase that, that can be tied onto you or not necessarily? Well, no, no, not okay. a, no. Be, uh, my, my history is as a business broker, and that's okay. where I gained the, the base of experience in doing this. Right, but now you've transitioned to more. To a, a consultant. consultant and a coach, yeah. yeah. So you're not really necessarily involved. You don't take a piece of the transaction of a buy sell. Correct. Okay. Right. So that's that's a di major difference, right, between a business broker, let's say, and a business consultant. Would people refer to you as a valuation consultant? I mean, is that part of it? Is the valuation of the business, even though you're looking at the cash flow? So, so what uh, I call myself is a private transaction advisor. Okay. Um, because it's kind of a, a, a catch-all phrase that that deals with everything to do with buying and selling a small privately owned business, sure. and putting a value on that business is one of the functions that I do. Okay. And in the world of Main Street businesses, it's very different from these bigger businesses. There are a lot of professional certifications that are available typically to accountants and finance people who are going to value these larger businesses. In the world of, of Main Street businesses, the, the best training actually comes from the world of business brokerage because brokers need to be able to properly evaluate a business in order to put it on the market. Sure. And I went through those trainings and certifications uh, back when I started my business brokerage sure. career back in 2008. Yeah. And so basically it's that base of education and then add on a decade of experience working with people is is where I get my background for helping people to show people what a business might sell for. Sure. And we're definitely going to transition into kind of your podcast aspect. But one last question here. When do these businesses bring you in? Uh, is there a trigger moment? Is it a number of years before they're thinking of selling the business? Is it some acquisition? They got an offer. They're looking to acquire or looking for a loan. Or what is a trigger or mechanism of when they're bringing you in? So there's two camps. There's the buyers and the sellers. Buyers will either bring me in when they found something that they want to look at and they're not quite sure how to go about looking at it. They'll usually go looking for someone like me. Yeah. And when they start typing questions into the internet, this is where the podcast comes into play. Right. Um, or they are people who know that they want to execute this journey of buying a business and they really want to get started on the right path. And, and I mentioned earlier that I have a group program. One of my group programs is for is for business buyers. On the selling side, Probably people should reach out to me a few years before they think they want to <laughs> right. sell. Right. But that only happens probably in about one in 10 cases yeah, that yeah. I, I get a, a, a preemptive call from someone who right. says, you know, I think in a few years I'm going to want to sell. Can I, I'd like to start working on this and get my head around it and understand right. that, that's what, ideal what I can see. do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But most people will go looking for this kind of information when a pressing personal concern has suddenly right. landed in their lap. Yeah. yeah. So health concern, right. marriage breakdown, right. uh, something forcing them to retire, some other critical thing happens. And all of a sudden they feel motivated for the first time to really take it seriously. And then it's, it's like a firefighting situation. And sure. a lot of the options, unfortunately, are curbed in that circumstance. So let's transition. So that's a good, good point. Right. And, and maybe, maybe, and, and I'd love for you to share if this is true. Does your podcast help educate on the timeline of, of helping people make more of that ideal choice and decisions like me doing the right choices of life and eating habits, let alone business habits before you really need to, before the doctor is saying, uh, tick tock. Uh, so from that aspect, when and how, and why did you start the podcast? So when did you start? I started in 2014 yeah. and, and so it's been going for quite a few years yeah. and, you know, to answer your question, do I talk about timelines and things? Yes. I talk about all kinds of aspects of, basically I, I categorize my topicality into buying, selling, financing, and managing small and medium sized businesses. And so those are the, the topics that I talk about in my weekly monologue. So yeah. every Wednesday morning, I have a new video that gets released. And those videos are almost entirely generated by questions that I receive through comments on YouTube or emails or things that people tweet to me on Twitter. Sure. And so I, I keep a database on my computer of good questions that come in. And once a month, I sit down, I record a batch of them. Cool. And these get released every Wednesday morning. And then I meet interesting people that I sometimes want to have conversations with. And I do those Monday 
uh, not every Monday, but on Mondays, there's a certain time slot that that YouTube tells me is an ideal time of the month and week to to release a new piece of content. And that's where I usually try to do a live um, using StreamYard. And so yeah. we get we get viewers that then contribute questions. And what I found, I only started that in 2021 doing yeah. the interviews live, but I found that the interactivity really enhanced the overall quality of the experience. And the viewers obviously enjoy it, being able yeah. to participate. So let's parse that out a little. So it's almost like two different shows. Do you, do you call them differently? Like, do you title them differently? No, I, I just, I, I say that it's David C. Barnett, Small Business and Deal Making. That's just what I call it. And then the, that's the YouTube channel. I, I yeah. ripped the audio off of everything right. and I put it onto an audio feed. And then in the audio, there's sometimes some other extra bonus material that gets put into that. Very cool. So where can people, obviously people are watching uh, Wednesday mornings, and then Monday afternoons, let's say around five o'clock Eastern, as an example, on your YouTube channel. Um, any other social media where the video is shared? So when uh, when I create a video, I then am big at repurposing to sure. to spread my net as widely as possible. Right. So I have a blog that I embedded on. Well, um, I will publish an article on Medium.com with the yeah. article embedded, as well as LinkedIn. Using their How do you create the feature? article? Is it like a read-along transcript or is it a completely re, like you no. said, repurposed, but is it? No, the, the, the article is simply a 100 to 200 word write-up that okay. talks about the problem or the concern addressed in the video, but doesn't tell you the answer. Cool. So the okay. whole idea behind that little 150 words is to get people to want to watch it, <laughs> right? Okay. And so that goes out to my email list. Yeah. It goes on LinkedIn. It goes on the blog. It 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 gets populated everywhere. It goes out on uh, Twitter, etc. Right. And and the whole purpose of that is to try to get as many views in the first twenty four hours as possible of the new video because it's an important metric for YouTube's algorithm. Sure. So the more viewing, the more social interaction that a video gets in the first day, the more likely the algorithm uh, algorithm will be to show it to new people who haven't seen it before. Sure. And so. So I, I repurpose the content across all those different places and then the audio as well. Um, because a lot of the times, sometimes I'll do a whiteboard video where I'm drawing mm -hmm. numbers and things like that. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the times it's just me talking. And yeah. so I get a lot of feedback from people who simply listen to me in the car or yeah. while they're hiking or walking or what have you. So the, especially the, the Wednesday morning ones, which are more monologue uh, as opposed to single, right? As opposed to dialogue, which is two or more. Um, so, with the Wednesday mornings, how long, how short is it? Typically between nine and about 15 or 18 minutes. So okay. like they're not catch. too long and okay. you're specifically addressing a question. And the reason why I've, I've, I stumbled upon this particular format is years ago, I was reading about how people increasingly are putting long form questions into Google. Sure. Where people are actually typing a question. Yeah. How do I thaw a pumpkin pie? You know, whatever. And so I realized that if I created a video that addressed a long form question and YouTube listens to what you say and it's tied in with Google, sure. if people go looking for that exact thing, then there's a really good chance that that video gets brought up as a search result. And so the videos themselves are each specifically optimized to the SEO of that particular question. That long form, long tail type question. Right. That's really and neat. And so it, it basically, after years of doing this, if you think about a fisherman you know, out sure. in the water, it's right. like each one of those videos is a hook in the water. And yeah. so the opportunity for me to, to meet someone who's looking for that piece of information has just grown over time. And then, um, you know, if you understand about the authority rankings of YouTube right. channels, Sure. The, the more videos you make in a certain topic realm, yeah. the more authority your channel will will be given accordingly to that topic set of topics, I guess. Yeah. And so um, if there was another video out there from someone who didn't have as much of a, of a, of a catalog as I did right. about the same thing, mine would sort of be favored over theirs. And so- sure. when um, when people talk about building up something like a podcast or a YouTube channel, and how it becomes an asset. This is the kind of way that it becomes an asset, because it which is a good really, segue. So, 
have, yeah. have people come out of the woodwork of your audience? Have they shared any examples, anecdotes, stories of how your videos and your podcast in general has helped and answered a specific question that they had in mind or that they searched for? You know, oh, more than happen? weekly. More oh, than yeah, weekly. yeah. Okay, I, so I, multiple I times a week, people are I contacting do. you and it's yeah. like, hey, David, that was spot on. Thank you so much for the answer. And maybe it leads to business. Yeah, I, I get comments and emails all the time from people who say, uh, because of your video on this, I didn't do this, and it probably saved hundred grand. Yeah, right. That's and so, the and these ROI are, um, these are videos too. that you've been doing for years, right? Because you you recently started Mondays the, the dialogue, but these are Wednesday videos. So, are people coming out of the woodwork of videos that you recorded like months, years ago, or is That's, it relatively uh, recent? Yeah, there are videos from years ago that still get nice. views every week. So, yeah. so I only started the live streaming of the interviews in twenty twenty one. Before yeah. in 2020 and earlier, I still did some interviews, but I made them part of my Wednesday lineup. And so every once in a while, I would have a Wednesday sure. uh, video that was 40 minutes long and it was an interview. Yeah. Right. Um, what I found is that the engagement wasn't as great. Um, I would get a lot of people. I would see that I would get a lot of people who would listen to the first five minutes and then stop listening to the video. But on that particular week, my audio downloads would soar. <laughs> so, so people in my audience are aware yeah. that they have a choice of how they can consume this. Right. And so they might watch me for a few minutes and go, that's interesting, but I'll listen in the car. Right. And so. And do you think it's because it's a longer form video? So I it's so. for me to sit there in the nooks and crannies of my day. I'm not sitting watching a 40 minute video, but I'll, you know, I'll put it in the car or while yeah. dishes yeah. or the commute. Yeah, exactly. And so when I entered, when I made them live though, yeah. What changed was the opportunity for people to have a reason to sit there and watch it, I think, <laughs> okay. because then they can put in their comments and I can sure. pop them up on the screen and, and, and there's more interactivity. And, and so talk to us about that. What prompted, was it COVID and that you weren't able to meet people face to face, you know, being presumptive here, but is it that, or was there some other reason that you said, no, let me start doing a, a live stream dialogue as opposed to just every now and then having that version Wednesdays. What prompted you to go, all right, all in, well, as someone who promotes their business using YouTube and social media, I yeah. read articles and things right. about these platforms, right? Right. And so I was reading an article that was just talking about how different social media platforms were um, sort of giving a right of way or, or um, giving um, better priority. treatment to the yeah. live content. Right. Priority. So, sure. Yeah. Priority to live content. And so I, so I thought, well, maybe I'll try that. Right. And, and, you know, for anything that you're going to do in these online platforms, the most important thing is consistency and Absolutely. duration of effort. Right. <laughs> and so when I decided at the beginning of 2021, I was going to try live interviews, that meant for a year. Yeah. And it meant I was committed to doing it for a year. And the results have been that I'm going to carry on in 22. Good for you. And, and so where do you live stream? I know you use stream yard like I do, like we are doing right now. Um, and you obviously stream live to YouTube, you mentioned. Do you stream live to any other social platform? I do. I, I My number one platform as far as subscribers is YouTube. My second one yeah. is LinkedIn. Cool. And so when I stream, uh, I, I use StreamYard. I have the, yeah. the, level, the account that lets me do it to three different places at a time. Yeah, likewise. Yeah. So I do LinkedIn, I do YouTube, and then I'll do Facebook. And right. Not that I have a big following on Facebook, but it's there. So, so yeah, I add it. Right? Awesome. And, um, and it's interesting because for most of the time, um, it's my live audiences are probably equally split between LinkedIn and YouTube, even though I've got twice as many subscribers on YouTube. So the and engagement think on LinkedIn the, is huge. Yeah, because it's the stumble upon aspect of LinkedIn, do you think, where people are just scrolling and they're there? Or what do you think? What's your No, I, I think it's because the audience, you know, anyone who's going to subscribe to my channel has to have an interest in business. Sure. But people who have an interest in business are also on LinkedIn all the time. And yeah. so I just think it's a it's a an even more concentra okay. concentrated group of people that have a definite defined interest sure. in the topic matter. Yeah. Um Whereas in, in my YouTube audience, I have people that are interested in business, but they're probably interested in a lot of other things too. Right. And so if something else is, is more uh, uh, exciting to them in the moment, <laughs> entertaining they, they might go someplace sure. else. Yeah. yeah, fair enough. So there's, a, so there's a lot more competing eyeballs literally on the screen of a YouTube 
uh, screen, right? There's a yeah. multiple aspects versus perhaps the vertical scrolling of LinkedIn, let alone the live priority where either people are being notified that you're going live or they see you going live. And it's still somewhat of novelty because most people don't have LinkedIn live access and even still less uh, are actually using it on a consistent basis. Uh, before we go for a commercial break, we talked a little bit about how your audience has reached out to you and, and talked about the benefit that they're achieving and receiving. Talk to me about the guests. What kind of guests do you have on your Monday show? Um, how do you choose them? And what kind of response or engagement have you seen with them? Have they benefited from being on your show? Undoubtedly, you have, and, and your audience has benefited from them coming on the show. Can you share with us who they are and why they yeah. come on and you know, how they benefit? Yeah. So, so basically, I choose people based on those four topic areas that I mentioned before, buying, selling, financing, and managing small and medium-sized businesses. And, and I would even branch out slightly more into personal finance aspects of people who might do one of those four things. Sure. So, so it's of interest to the people who are, who are watching. Now, right. the, the guests, this is interesting because years ago when my subscriber base was small, I had to go and ask people to come on my show. Yeah. Now that it's becoming larger um, and as there are more people interested in promoting through podcasts and right. sure. I'm now bombarded with requests. And in fact, it's something that my assistant has to help me with. Good. Not only do we, do I need help sorting out who these different candidates are that are stepping forward, but um, anyone who appears on my show and I talk with them, there's an implied endorsement, right? Right. Oh, absolutely. And so so the, the question is, is who is this person and are right. they really who they say, right? So how do you vet them? Do you do a pre-meeting? Uh, is there a form? Yes to both? The no, it's how, a lot How more, is that vetting? It's yeah. a lot more work than that. So Tell so me. if they if they say that they're an author, the next question sure. is send me the uh, next thing is send me the book. Yeah. And, and I will actually read it. And I, I'll check out and I'll be, believe me, um, in the world of of self-publishing and Amazon direct publishing and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, I've gotten a quarter or halfway through some of these and just thrown them in the garbage. Like, no, that's not a good <laughs> book. And I'm not going to bring this person on my show. Uh, and and the other thing are, are people who are outright trying to game or pirate their way through the system. What, so, do, you mean, what do you mean pirate or game their way through the system? So Too self-promotional or what do you mean? Well, no, no. I, everyone who's in business should be self-promoting. Fair. But That's I, I, mean. yeah. I got a, a request for someone to come on my show who was proclaiming that they were, you know, had all these accolades in the world of commercial real estate investing and development and things like this. And um, we checked out all their social media. And right. this person had an Instagram account with 10,042 followers. They had only ever made 20 posts <laughs> and never gotten a single comment on any post. So it's a lot of fake bot type followers. I think they have 42 followers and they paid for 10,000. <laughs> and so, so when I see that, I'm like, like this, this person is, is trying to fraudulently game the system. Yeah. Um, it makes me question everything that they've said. Sure. Right. And I they just want to touch them, everything goes I won't touch them with a 10 foot pole. And, and for people that are listening, like, I get emails all the time from people in, you know, you know, a lot of times in developing countries where they will say, you know, for X amount of dollars, I can, I can add 10,000 views to your next right. video. Right. Yes. Don't do it. Don't do it. Uh, because it, number one, if anyone like me goes to investigate you and, and, and I see the results, you know, somebody who gets 10,000 views on a video should have like 800 comments. Right, right, right. I mean, it, it's obvious if views are real because the engagement will be there, and and there will be a track record, right? Um, if you if you try to cheat, you'll be spotted, and yeah. if the algorithm spots you, then you're toast. Even worse. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Let alone the integrity. I think. Yes. I. Well, I don't know if I if it's even worse, but it's just as worse, right? Because you're burning real relationships, let alone being burned on on YouTube. You know, both are just as bad, and it, it, it's. You know, rather than someone who's just starting out, it's all right, they're just starting out on social media, but they are clearly a subject matter expert in the real world, so to speak, in the offline world. And I'm sure you would respect that, that it's like, all right, well, good for you. you you've achieved the real stuff, the, the, the 
follower count may not be there, but they are nonetheless subject matter experts in this, in this truest sense. It, well, it's, it's interesting that you say that because uh, I have an upcoming um, guest for next week. And this person has been in the world of finance and uh, consulting for over 20 years, and they've just started to produce social media content. Right. Um, I investigated them. I checked a reference, you know, so I, I saw who they were connected to on LinkedIn. I saw a few mutual connections. I right. messaged those people, right. was, was given some thumbs up that this was a good person. And so they're coming on my show. And so them appearing on my show could have the opportunity to really help them gain some followers and, right. and, and, and grow their presence. Yeah. Um, but they really are an expert. I'm confident yeah. in that. And, yeah. and so if you are out there, um, actually speaking truthfully and delivering value, you are going to gather viewers. I mean, I've been on YouTube since night, since 1994 and I'm about to hit 20,000 subs. Nice. Now, most YouTube channels, you know, when, when my kids hear about my subscriber level, they're watching video game guys with a million. <laughs> yeah, fair enough, fair enough. And so it has to do with the field you're in. But yes. someone, someone who starts off new, who says, you know, well, how do I get that many? You know, how can I, how can I get ahead? Uh, sorry, <laughs> I've been on YouTube since 2014, not 1994. Okay, okay, fair enough. Okay. I, I just saw the comment there. Um, okay. So the, um, the, uh, you know. Full disclosure. We, we, you, we make mistakes you, and you got to get it. Produce value, produce value. And you will get people that want to listen to you. And if you're going to start some kind of social platform, you have to start by leaning on your professional and personal connections. So when I first started, I would promote on my personal Facebook, you know, to get sure. my friends and relatives to right. watch videos or subscribe, yeah. right? Right. right? Or I would announce it on LinkedIn. You know, I, I've, I've had different careers in sales. And one of the yeah. habits I started putting in place you know, a long time ago was after every meeting, I'd send a connection request to the person I met with on LinkedIn. And right. so as a result, I had a couple thousand connections on LinkedIn. Right. Right. So when I started to do the YouTube thing, I would share it over there and I, you know, and organically it will start to, to grow and organically people will share it. Correct. And, and that then leads to, you know, the big benefit for my business. Yeah, I mean, in terms of audience, there's that known and unknown, right? And, and I think you're talking rightfully, right? That focus on the known audience. There are a couple of hundred, maybe a couple of thousand people that you know already in your email list that are dormant in your LinkedIn. It's yeah. dormant. That's going to be the beginning of your listener viewer base. And then they'll start sharing it and you'll get to the unknown. You'll get to the word of mouth of strangers. But, you know, start with what you've got. And uh, the fact that you are bringing on subject matter experts and you're vetting them so thoroughly, I think... Uh, Hopefully this that scares off the, the charlatans, but also gives um, confidence to those who are truly subject matter experts and not just um, social media influencers in the fake sense of it, um, and and in just the pure metrics part of it that they ha they are substantive experts that you're bringing on. Have any of them shared uh, anecdotes of that they've got in business or they've got a response? Uh, in addition to like the views and, and, and things of like that. Oh, oh yeah. Because some of the people who've been on my show that within a few weeks or months, they reach out and they want to come back. Yeah. And they say, All right. like, like I've met clients because I was Good. on your show or, yeah. or can we work out some kind of promotional arrangement? Pro promotions and sponsorships is an interesting thing for me because um, again, it's an even higher degree of presumed um, endorsement. Sure. Right. And so I get, you know, for every person who wants to get on my show, every five or six of those people who try to volunteer themselves to be guests, I will get, uh, someone will reach out to me offering me some kind of joint venture or kickback scheme to promote whatever it is they're selling. And I avoid those. I avoid okay. them on purpose because, um, you know, unless I've gone through whatever it is they're selling and I know that it is the real deal. Sure. I won't want to endorse it, you know, right. uh, the mission of my business and my channel is to help people avoid bad deals. That's my mission. Right. And so I don't want to serve someone up potentially in a scenario where they could be misserved by someone else outside of my own control. And that there is some, maybe a conflict of interest that the only reason you are 
featuring them is because you're being paid. Um, and not that that's wrong to be paid, but it's a, oh, not the only reason. So do you have advertisers outside of yourself on your show? So this this year, actually, just before Christmas, I started yeah. my first one. Um, well, there was a disturbing trend in my YouTube comments where people were making fun of my outfits and my shirts. Okay. And so my assistant actually found the perfect sponsor, which was a tailor. All right. And it's a tailor that operates through the internet and can ship things, you know, to anyone. And so they were a perfect fit. So they supplied me with a, a wardrobe, including this, you know, tailored shirt that okay. I'm wearing today. That's going to be my question. And and um, at the end of every video, I put up an image where I talk about how they are the tailor. And there's a an offer for viewers. If they, yeah. they, they use a discount code, they can save. Right, right. But I've worn the clothes. I've gotten positive comments about the clothes. I don't have to worry about somebody paying for a shirt and then being sure. left disappointed. Yeah, and so yeah. it's not a business or financial type of product, but it's one that's easy for me to have confidence in. You are I'm, working with, I'm working with a second sponsor who I hope to bring on soon. And it's a much more complicated financially oriented product, but it's something that I started for myself a year and a half ago. And so now I'm at the point where I am ready to fully endorse and stand behind that, you know, and, you know, maybe one day, you know, I'll get someone like a, a credit card company or a sure. bank or like something a little bit more aligned office supply company or something like this that will want to sponsor it. And, and that'll be different again, you know, but I'll, I'll say that the, the one thing that, that I think about is I think about my own longevity in this business um, 46. Mm -hmm. So I've, you know, I've got like 20 years left that I intend to be operating in business, you know, sure. the way I am today, but then what comes next? You know, my, my business is very much me. It's not really as a, as a guy who helps people sell businesses. I know that mine is not really one to be sold, but I could see that my YouTube channel and, uh, sort of the media aspect of what I do in a promotional sense today could be turned very well into some kind of semi-retirement project that I could carry on for several more decades, you know. And could have that greater legacy and impact. Yeah. It's funny that you mentioned that because it's, there's, you know, in this world, right, like now, in addition to the video blogging service, we now have a, a video interview podcast service, which the commercial will talk about in a moment. And we, we kind of look at it whenever I talk about, uh, talk to new people who are starting podcasts, they're always talking one of three aspects or benefits that self-serving and i'd love to hear where it is for you and you kind of alluded a little bit that there's definitely a marketing visibility aspect to it right they just want greater visibility unlocking platforms of apple and google and youtube etc then there's the impact aspect right that they want to be educational they want to be able to be a greater resource or a greater number of people and have a greater impact and that very often if it's mission driven but it could be an attorney it could be a cpa it could be a coach they are mission driven by by value. And so they want that greater impact. And then there's a the profitability aspect that maybe the podcast itself can be profitable, not only just a form of visibility, but it can be an income generator, which you alluded to, uh, where affiliates and advertisers can be one revenue channel. Most people think about monetizing a podcast there, but very often in the short run, it's monetizing with the audience, where it's people coming out of the woodwork wanting to work with you or your guest, which can equally be powerful. And that obviously it becomes dollars in pocket because you're able to serve them well. But then even the guests themselves can be referral relationships and potential clients. And so the profitability can come in a variety of ways. And for you, you started uh, in the in this world 2014. Uh, now it's 2022. So that's, what what is that? Seven, eight, eight, eight years. Thank yeah. you. You're more of the numbers guy than I am. So that's eight <laughs> years in uh, before you were starting to court affiliates or advertisers either way you're specifically going with advertisers as opposed to a jv a profit share and affiliate type relationship and and i think that message is important for people who are starting podcasts people who are in the podcast world looking to monetize that you are your first advertiser mm -hmm. uh your audience and your guests are really where you're going to start monetizing because you serve them well uh, and they will serve you as well in, in a good way. And, and then eventually, yeah, sure, you can have other advertisers and affiliates. We're going to take a quick commercial break. Uh, and when we come back, I'd love for you to shine a spotlight on a show host that you love, that you're a raving fan of, um, one that may, perhaps you watch and you listen to. And I'd love to, for us to hear why uh, you like that show and maybe uh, why you like that host as well. Uh, so let's take a quick commercial break here. Do you want your own podcast like this one? 
My team will do all the grunt work for you. Just show up, smile, and enjoy talking to your potential clients and referral relationships. Go to videosocials.net slash go VIP to watch our nine minute webinar for all the details. Are you a busy lawyer, coach, consultant like me? You should have a podcast done for you to get you more clients, impress your colleagues, and it becomes your perpetual referrals flywheel. We find you the right guests. We schedule your guests, handle all the podcast tech, get you into Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and more done for you. Go to videosocials.net slash go VIP to watch our nine minute webinar for all the details. Now back to the show. Now back to our show. Well, David, you, you know, Vic, up. before before we talk about the other podcast, yeah. can I can I just summarize what my show does for me in my own business? Absolutely. If if you look at a diagram of a selling model, so typically in a in a sales model, there's a rapport building period, then there's like a, a fact finding, and sure. then there's developing a solution, presenting a solution, and then closing. You know that how does one make a sale? And if you've ever done sales before, that that rapport building is when you're talking to the person, getting to know them, establishing yeah. crush, trust, demonstrating. Right, you know, like and trust aspect. Sure. Yeah. And so for me personally, what the YouTube channel has done is it's automated the rapport building segment of that model. And so I no longer get people who call me up and say, I'd like with, to meet with you to understand your experience and see if you can help me. That doesn't happen anymore. That happened years ago, but it doesn't happen now. What happens now is people just email me and they say, hi, David, I've been watching your videos every evening for the past five days. This is my project. What is working with you look like? And so they already understand I can help them. They already understand that they, they want to work with me and that they feel that I'm going to be able to help them and that it's qualified. Now they just want to place an order. Sure. And so it's it really has done a lot for, for me and my professional service and to your point earlier about how you said the first advertiser on your channel is yourself, that's exactly how I treat the YouTube channel. It's like a giant yeah. advertising engine just for my own business. And it's it's only since the audience has grown to the size it has that these other sort of opportunities have come about. But still, the primary sponsor of my channel is me. Yeah. And, and it's to promote me. And the reason why I answer the questions and I deliver value all the time is just so that uh, when people watch the channel, they can get an understanding for what it is that I do, how I can help them. Um, yeah. And, and um, yeah. So it, you it, it, I think that's great. And it reminds me, and I'm going to bastardize a Peter Drucker quote, Peter Drucker, the famed management consultant, kind of father of management science. And, and he, he has a quote to the fact where uh, the job of marketing is to make sales irrelevant, where even a, a dog with a note in his mouth can do the sales. So you know your marketing is working, David, because essentially you have become an order taker in a good way because marketing is doing its job. It's paving the road, enabling people to drive to you so that you're not having to do any kind of persuasion selling. They're sold. They're in buying mode uh, because they've done their work of checking you out, but you've done the work of helping and serving them even before they were quite ready to sign any dotted line, but they're coming to you ready. And that's a tremendous way of you using your video show and your dialogue podcast. That's awesome. Yeah. And are you a fan of other shows? Is there any shows? That I, you, I am. You know, there are a few shows that I look forward to every week. Yeah. And and the one that uh, came to mind when you asked me the question was uh, the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary with okay. uh, David McIlvaney and Kevin Oreck. They're the two hosts. Yeah. And, these guys, uh, they're in a wealth management company out in Colorado, um, but they the podcast is about geopolitics and economics. So they're talking about Federal Reserve policy. They're talking about relations between different countries. They're talking about yeah. you know how something happening in Asia or Europe is impacting something happening in North America and what wow. they expect the Fed to do. And and so yeah, it's, it's a very stuff. intelligent. Uh, yeah. conversation that happens every week and at the base of it all is this is a wealth management company they're looking for right. clients you know who have sure. money that need to be managed um, but these are very sophisticated topics attracting a yeah. very sophisticated type of investor or or well-off individual and and what i enjoy about that podcast it kind of sort of uh, encouraged me as i was going because you know 2014 2014 is when i started 
you know, at the end of the first year, I had 500 subs. Yeah. At the end of year two, I had 2,000. At the end of year three, I might have had six, right? And so percentage-wise, it's growing quickly, but it's not exciting, right? <laughs> but once I got to around 3,000 subscribers, I started to regularly get clients from my audience. Yeah. And so the, the high subscriber count, the vanity metrics are not required, you know? Okay. You, what you need are the right people in your audience who could potentially become your customer, in, in my case. And this would be the same for the McElvaney commentary. And so I don't know how many people download, but they've been going for well over a decade and they wouldn't be doing it unless they were getting similar kind of results, right? So yeah. it doesn't matter what the size of the audience is. It matters that it's the right people. Yeah, right. So it's quality, not quantity is another pithy way of saying it. That's, that's excellent, David. Where can we find your show? Obviously, your YouTube channel. So if we type in David C. Barnett uh, or davidcbarnett.com, uh, we'll find your YouTube channel. Um, and where can we listen to it? So it's on all the major podcast platforms. All you have to do is look for David C. Barnett, Small Business and Deal Making, and, and it will it will pop up. That's excellent. So you highlight a lot of great points in terms of using metrics properly, vetting guests ex exquisitely, and providing a tremendous amount of value uh, multiple times a week, twice a week for your audience so they come out of the woodwork and you're able to basically monetize the visibility of the impact and the profitability of your podcast. And I think that's tremendous. And that's the reason why I do this show. I, I, I want this show to be educational for podcast hosts, mm -hmm. um, as well as for you as a guest, you're bringing out your thoughts, you know, uh, which maybe, maybe you do a lot of meta, but this is very meta, right? For you to talk about the show and not just be in the show. Uh, and um, this has been tremendously insightful. Are you coming uh, back to our show host network? Do you know February 24th? You I, I am actually, I attended, I attended the first one and yeah. I intend to come back. Um, right. And I, I, um, I've got a lot out of it. And I actually met a couple of people who I've ended up uh, working with. Oh, who, cool. Who uh, I've done some, uh, some videos with. Oh, excellent. So have you been on their show or you've been on their show, stuff like that? I had someone come over on mine. Excellent. So yeah. for, for those of uh, listening and watching who have no idea what we're just talking about. So if you go to videosocials.net slash show hosts, this is a show host networking event that we do just about once a month. We started in December, as David is referring to, we're starting to standardize it for the last Thursday of the month. So it happens that we're right now in February, 2022, to February 24th at 1 p.m. Eastern, then March 31st, 1 p.m. Eastern. We haven't released the April date, but most likely it'll be the last Thursday in April. So it'll always be at videosocials.net slash show hosts. So if you host a, a video podcast, a audio podcast, a live stream, or some other kind of video show, definitely come on, especially if you like being featured as a guest expert on other people's shows, on other people's podcasts. And if you feel you're a subject matter expert and you can be valuable to David's kind of show, other lawyers, accountants, coaches, and consultants are the show hosts. So if you have a expertise relevant to those type of uh, professionals and their clientele, come on in uh, and it'll be great for you to kind of get vetted uh, by our show hosts. Uh, you can watch this show uh, just about every Friday at noon Eastern. It's streamed live on YouTube and LinkedIn and Facebook. Uh, and you can listen to it much like David's podcast on the four major and the other minor uh, podcast platforms from Apple Podcasts, Google, Stitcher, Spotify, uh, and many, many others. Again, my name is Vikram Rajan. I am your host and co-founder of videosocials.net. Thank you again, David. This has been extremely insightful. We went a little over time, but it was well worth it for the amount of insight that you brought uh, to the world of, of podcast hosting. And Thanks for having me on, Vic. It's always a pleasure. Yeah, this is great. Thanks.